We began last week on a series entitled How to Effectively Study the Bible. Last week we gave an introduction to this series and we went through the course outline. We discussed some of the different topics that we'll be dealing with uh, in this series. Today what we want to do is we want to cover the first two topics if time permits in that series. The first two topics the yeah, course outline is why study the Bible and ingredients for effective Bible study. If time permits, those are the two we're going to accomplish today. Question. Why is it important that we study the Bible? Why study the Bible? Why is that important? Or why should we do it? Sis? Study it so we can grow. Okay. Okay. So it gives you tools to help deal with the issues of life. It helps you to grow spiritually. And it helps you to be approved of God. Right? Anyone else? Let me give you some more reasons why we should study the Bible. It is the, it is the voice of God for us today. It is how God chooses to communicate with his creation in this dispensation. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, the Bible says, God at sundry times and in divers manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. God speaks to us today through his Son. In times past, in the two prior dispensations, I hear ringing, and the two dispensations God spoke to the fathers through the prophets in the patriarchal dispensation he spoke to the father who was responsible for getting the message to his family during the mosaic dispensation he spoke to Moses who wrote it in the book and he used prophets to give his word to his people but today God speaks to us through his son and the words of his son are contained in this book Okay, so we need to study this book so that we can know what God is saying to us through his son. All right. We should study the Bible because it contains the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, and the doom of sinners. It lets us know what's on God's mind. We can know God's mind by knowing what his word says, because it's, conveyed, it's revealed in his word, contained in his word, right? Our state is revealed in his word. Let me ask you a question. <clears throat> Where did we come from? Where did man come from? Why are we here? Where do we go when we leave here? These are questions that only can be answered from this book. Look at the consequences of answering these questions apart from the book. Why are we here? The theory of evolution says that we evolved from some single cell. We evolved from some slime pool somewhere and evolved through the years, through the ages, you know, first as an animal and then, you know, evolving eventually into where we are now. And people have believed that for so long till they start to If you come from animals long enough, you're going to start acting like an animal. Why are we here? If you answer that question apart from the book, you will conclude that you are here to do your own thing. Go for the gusto. Get all you can and can all you get and sit on the can. As a result of that, Many people's lives are messed up. Many people live frustrated and regret-filled lives because they do not know what their purpose is. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a few moments. Where do we go when we leave here? Apart from this book, people think, well, you just go to sleep. Consequently, because you do not realize that, and someone gave from Ecclesiastes chapter 13 and 14, when you 
conclude that there are no consequences, there is no life after this life, therefore no accountability for what you do in this life, people live any kind of way they want without any fear of any kind of consequences. You see? So these questions answered apart from God's word have some serious consequences. You agree who has Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verses 13 and 14 Thank you, sister. The book says that our duty, our purpose in this life is to fear God. And that word fear means to reverence, to respect, to hold God in awe. So if you live a life with no respect for God, no regard for God, you see? Mm -hmm. Now here's another thing it says. But this is the whole duty of man, for God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing. What that verse is saying <clears throat> is, this is the whole duty of man, to fear God and keep his commandments. Right? Our attitude in life should be fear and obedience. Right? That's why we're here, to reverence God, to be obedient to his word. Right? Why? Because we are accountable. There is a day when we're going to have to give an account for what we've done in this life. And to not know what God's word says, how, what attitude we should have towards God and about this life, knowing that we are accountable, has dire consequences, right? Another reason why we should study the Bible, <clears throat> because man is not able to direct his own steps. Jeremiah 10, 23, Jeremiah says, Oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his own steps. Psalm is said in Psalm 119, verse 104, O Lord, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. We do not know the way. We can't get there by ourselves. But you know, the problem is that many people believe and live as though they know the way. Is that all ye like sheep are gone astray. Every man has turned to his own way. That's the world we live in. We live in, brothers and sisters. Everybody's doing their own things. Three things about sheep. Sheep are, they have no sense of direction. They are defenseless. They have no built-in defense mechanism. And they're dumb. So sheep, by nature, need to have a shepherd. Amen. And that's why the psalmist says, David said in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Because sheep are defenseless, because they have no sense of direction, because they are dumb, they need a shepherd to guide them, to protect them, provide, to provide for them. Right? David said, the Lord is my shepherd, so... Problem is, people think they don't need a shepherd. They think they are the shepherd. Captain of their own ships, you know, their own destinies in their own hands. You see? But that's not true. The book teaches us that we are sheep. We have no sense of direction. We do not know the way by ourselves, right? We cannot provide for ourselves. We cannot defend ourselves from the enemy who is Satan, right? The book says, as a roaring lion, he's roaming about seeking whom he may devour. You know, out there in the jungle, lions do some damage to sheep when sheep are apart from their shepherd. And he does the same thing to us. Number four, why I studied the Bible. It contains the will of God for time and eternity. 
It lets us know what God's purpose is for our lives. For mankind. I just read it in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. But now, here's a personal question for you. Do you know what God's purpose is for your lives? Because God has a purpose for each and every one of our lives individually. Do you know what your purpose is? How many of you know? Just raise your hand. You don't have to say anything. Just raise. How many of you know what God's purpose is for your individual life? Okay. See? And I didn't always know. I just found out not too many years ago. So don't feel bad because you don't know. But that's something that you need to think about. And if you don't know, that's something you need to pray about and ask God to help you to find because he has a purpose for your life. And there are two things that happens when you do not know the purpose for a thing. And the word, the purpose, defined as, you know, the, the reason for something being in existence, the reason why it's made, the reason why it's done, okay? Who knows what the purpose of a butter knife is? Cut butter. <laughs> That's obvious, huh? What else, what else you use butter knife for? Huh? Cut butter and spread it. To spread soft substances, right? What would happen if I used a butter knife as a wrench? Use it as a screwdriver. So it would work. You tear it up. Use it as a huh? You destroy it. It looked like this. Wouldn't it? Right. I use this butter knife as a wrench. I, and it's all bent up from trying to, you know. I use it as a screwdriver and the head is all messed up mm -hmm. on it. Because I used it for a purpose other than what it was designed and intended to be used for. This may be amusing, but there are a lot of people whose lives look just like this butter knife. Because they did not know what their purpose was. And they went through life abusing and misusing their lives. And so their lives look just like this. Good news is, God can fix this. Through Jesus Christ, he can fix this. As long as you have life and, you know, breath and your capacity, God can fix your life. And that's good news, right? right. Let's look at some ingredients for effective Bible study. We've already concluded that we need to study the Bible, right? It is important that we study the Bible. Let's look at some ingredients for effective Bible study. How many of you ever baked a cake? Oh, I got a brother raising hand. Raise your hand up high, bro. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about, see? That's a real man. He's not, he's not ashamed to say he baked cakes. You like to eat them cakes. That's probably why you bake them. Yeah. <laughs> what is needed to bake a cake? I'm not talking about a box and the water and, you know, two cups of water and you make, no. From scratch. What is needed to bake a cake? Flour, Flour sugar, sugar eggs, eggs, butter. butter. What are these things? What are these things? Ingredients, right? In order to make a cake, you must have certain ingredients. And if you are missing, absent these ingredients, your cake is not coming out right, right? So it is with effective Bible study. There are certain ingredients that are needed in order for us to effectively study this book. You all have your handouts? Ingredients for effective Bible study. <clears throat> Number one, an open mind. You must have an open mind when you study God's word, right? In other words, you cannot approach the study of God's word with any preconceived ideas, any preconceived notions. A lot of people use the Bible as a proof text. They already have their mind made up about what something's supposed to be, and they go to the Bible to try and prove their point. That's called proof text. That's called eisegete and reading into the scriptures. When you approach God's word, your mind should be such as, you know, a blank page that you're going to allow God to write on that page. Isn't that right? Like a sponge. Exactly right. Then you must also have a receptive heart when you study, approach the study of God's word. 
your attitude, your mindset should be. Lord, speak to me. And whatever your will is, whatever your word says, I'll do it. That's what we should have. We should have receptive hearts when it comes to studying God's word. Right? Then we should have a respectful and appreciative attitude towards the word. Why? This is the word of God. This is a holy and divine, divinely inspired book. And so when we approach the study of it, we should approach it with an attitude of respect and appreciation for the fact that God revealed himself to us and put it in a book where we can have it. Right? It may sound, you know, redundant, may sound trite, but these are very important ingredients to being effective in God's word. Then we must have an understanding of the purpose of this book. What is the purpose of this book? Hmm? Hmm? Okay. Huh? The informants of the word. The purpose of the Bible. <clears throat> is to demonstrate God's grace towards us. To demonstrate the fact that we need God. Amen. God has provided for our needs through his son. And our compliance with the conditions that he has set to meet our needs brings him glory. That's what the story of this whole book is about, y'all. How many of you ever used a, a, a puzzle, a jigsaw puzzle? This is 500 pieces puzzle. I think it's 500 pieces. All right? This is one piece of that puzzle. There's 499 in here. There's one here. What do I need to know in order to know where this piece fits into these. Huh? Well, yeah, I know it has to be put together, but the question is, how do I know where to put it? How do I know where this piece fits into these pieces? You need to know what the looks like. This is a red piece right here. The only way to know where this red piece fits with all of these other colors, green and white and blue, I need to be able to see the big picture and have some idea on where this red piece goes. Right? right. Well, it's the same way with the Bible. In order to know where baptism, the baptismal piece fits into the puzzle, we need to know the big picture. In order to know where you know, necessity of being in a large church fits into the puzzle. We need to know the big picture, right? One of those handouts that I gave you describes the big picture. I'm not going to take the time to go through all of it. I'll just tell it to you, give you a, a synopsis of it. Long story short, when God created man, he created man perfect and upright put him in perfect environment, gave him some responsibilities, gave him some restrictions, and told them that attached to the violation of those restrictions were consequences, right? Put him in a garden, gave him a job, gave him a wife, gave him a home, gave him everything he needed. Told him of all of the trees in the garden, of the fruit of all of the trees in the garden, you can freely eat, but this one tree, don't eat of it. If you do, the day you eat thereof, you will surely die. And just as a little sidebar right here. The Bible said, told Adam and Eve, the day they eat of that fruit, they will die. Did they die? The Bible says Adam lived 930 years. Did he die that day? Well, 
One day is as a day, a thousand years as a day. Okay, that's true. That's figurative language, though. That's, that's not literal for this thing. My brother said he didn't die that day. But God said, the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Did God mean that day, or did he mean some other day? Or did he die some other way? Say it loud, sis. Death is, by definition, a separation. When you die physically, your spirit leaves your body. That constitutes death. Adam and Eve died that day because their relationship was separated from God. That day, they died spiritually. You see? Now, it took a lot more years for Adam for them to die physically, but that day they died spiritually. Here is the point, though. They died that day. Their sin separated them. From that point forward, man constantly sinned and was separated from God. God knew this. So before they ever did it, God already had a plan in mind to redeem them back to him, to reconcile that relationship back to himself. And the plan was to get Jesus Christ so that he can die on the cross to pay the price for the sins that mankind committed and be reconciled back to himself in one body. You see? That's the big picture. But unless you have an idea and understanding of that big picture, you have trouble understanding where these pieces fit in. You see? But when you understand it's all about, and in the Old Testament, you know, God selected a certain group of people to preserve the bloodline, physical body of Christ into this world. He chose the Jews, the children of Israel, as his chosen people. Right? So when Jesus came into the world, and then he lived, and he died, he fulfilled the purpose for which he came. Right? right. So he came, he died, paid the price, reconciled man, established the church so that God can reconcile both Jew and Gentile, because when they were estranged, when the children of Israel was God's people and the Gentiles were outside looking in. Matter of fact, somebody get that for me. Ephesians chapter 2, getting with verse 11. When the Jews and Gentiles were not together, the Jews looked down on the Gentiles. There was enmity between the Jews and Gentiles. But when Christ came, he not only reconciled man's relationship back to God, but he reconciled the relationship between Jews and Gentiles so that they are all one in that one body. Ephesians chapter 2. Go ahead, brother. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through... Well, I tell you, stop. Therefore, remember that formerly... You who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves circumcised, that done in the body by the hands of men, remember that that time you were separated from Christ, included from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenant of the promise without hope and without God in the world. Mm -hmm. But now in Christ Jesus, you who, were, who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. Keep reading. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing in his flesh the law with its, with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace, and in the one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. 
Verse 20. Well, read all the way. Read all the way. Consequently, you who are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, be on the foundations of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. Okay. In him the whole building is joined together and raises and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Thank you. You see what's going on? Paul is speaking to the Ephesian Christians now who are Gentiles. And he began in verse number 11 by saying, Wherefore, remember that at one time you were on the outside looking in, that you were strangers. You were out without, you know, outside of the covenant of God, outside of the promises of God, without Christ and without God and without hope in this world. But God came, gave his son, and his son died and reconciled not only you with God, but you with the Jews so that there's no more two Jew and Gentile. We are all one in one body. You see, that's the significance of the Lord's church. It's not that we wear a different name on our sign. It's not that we don't have pianos and organs and guitars up in here. It's that this is the place that God chose to reconcile both Jew and Gentile and mankind back to himself in this one body. You see? That's the big picture. And when you understand the big picture, these smaller pieces of the puzzle makes more sense to you. Right? I'll give you another illustration so it can help you understand the big picture. All of us in here have a body, right? One body. And yet this one body is comprised of many different members. There are over 30 different systems in the Bible, in the body. You have the skeletal system, the muscular system, you know, the digestive system, reproduction. All of these systems all work in concert, all work in one for this one body to function. Right? And if any one of these systems get out of whack, the body is going to suffer for it. Paul used that same argument in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 when he was dealing with an issue that the church where they were fussing and fighting among themselves about who had the better gift. Those you know, who had the gift of speaking in tongues thought they were better than those who had the gift of prophecy. Paul used an analogy from anatomy, used the human body to demonstrate that we are all many members, but it's one body. So we all should function together. The eyes don't do what the ears does, but does that mean that the ears are not important? No. You know? Do you think you have any unimportant part of your body? God didn't give any spare parts. Every, bo- every part of your body has a function. And to show you if you think that a small member is not important, one of the smallest members of your body is your little toe. If you think it's not important, cut it off. And you have to learn how to walk all over again. It's a small member, but it's important. And that's one of the things that we have problems with in the large church. We have problems in the large church because some people believe that, you know, because they have a gift to teach or to sing or to preach, you know, that they're more important than the person who's working behind the scene. The person who takes the Lord's Supper to someone who's sick and shuddering is just as important as the person who gets up here and preaches. The person who gets on the phone and prays for someone who's sick or who's, you know, going through some trouble is important to God as the person who stands before y'all and teach a Bible class. Every member has a purpose. Every member has a gift and every last one of them are important to the Lord and are necessary for the function of the body. You see? So we understand the importance of knowing the big picture. Right. And how that how that plays into uh, understanding if if another thing we need to know, another ingredient for effective Bible study is understanding the two major divisions 
in the Bible. Remember I said this was a library of books, 66 books, right? 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. It's divided Old Testament, New Testament. One of the problems that, that we have in religion today is a lot of people mix the two up. You know, there are certain things that God gave to a certain group of people in the Old Covenant that don't apply to us. We are under the New Covenant, the New Testament, right? right. And when you understand that, then it'll help you be more effective when you study in the book. Another thing, another ingredient for effective Bible study is understanding that there were three dispensations. And dispensations are systems, methods that God used to speak to his man. We read about it in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. You know, God has sent you time to die as a man and spake in times past to the fathers by the prophets. During the patriarchal dispensation, and it's in your handout. I'm not going to go through all of it, but it's in your handout. The patriarchal dispensation, patriarch means father, father rule. During that time, God spoke directly to the fathers, to the head of the family. And the head of the family conveyed God's message to his family. Then that system was replaced by the Mosaic dispensation in which God took his word and he put it in writing. He gave the Ten Commandments to Moses on Mount Sinai and he gave, you know, the statutes and ordinances contained in, in the Torah, the Old Testament, to his man. And he spoke to man through prophets, right, and priests. But now... In this dispensation, God speaks to us through his son. So we can't cite Moses as authority for doing anything that we do today. Everything we do today has to be in this dispensation, has to be by the authority of Jesus Christ. And when you understand these things, it helps us be more efficient in studying God's word. I'm really looking forward to this. Next week, we're going to look at Actually, we're going to start talking about that Bible study triangle I talked about. Observation, interpretation, and application. Next, matter of fact, I'm going to do this right now. I don't have them with me. I'm going to give you a handout next week. That it's, it's like two paragraphs of, you know, just saying something. But contained in those two paragraphs are the names of 20 books in the Bible. And your task is going to be to identify, underline the names of the 20 books in that Bible, or in that the passages. And what that's going to do is going to test your ability to observe, mm -hmm. your observation skills, mm -hmm. you see. And we need to know these things. You know, the better your observation skills are, the better you're going to be at studying this word. And in life, because in life, if you have good observation skills, you'll be able to recognize when something is from God and when it's not from God. You know, when God is just testing your faith or when Satan is trying to trip you up, observation skills will help you to be able to identify these things. So I'm going to give you that. Then I'm going to give you another outline, an exercise. I'm going to give you some scriptures. And then each of those scriptures, I want you to tell me what the scripture says. What do you see in that text? You see? And you'd be surprised what some people see in a text. Mm -hmm. You know, stuff that's not even there. But it's going to help, be able to help you to identify how to do that. All right? Then when we get to interpretation, I'm going to give you some exercises. I'm going to give you some text to tell me what it means. Okay? So I'm looking forward to that. Y'all ready? Y'all on the line? Any questions, comments from today? Ma'am, the timeline? Uh, it's, it's in the handout. The timeline is in there. It tells you how long each dispensation lasted. Uh, the uh, patriarchal dispensation, here you go, lasted 2,500 years from the creation of Adam and Eve to the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. The Mosaic dispensation lasted 50 years from the giving of the, Mount, uh, the law on Mount Sinai to Christ's death on the cross. Patriarchal dispensation began when Christ died on the cross and is going to last until he comes back. The Christian dispensation, I'm sorry. 
So that's the one we're living in now. And so far, it's been 2,000 years and counting. Okay? And you, some people think that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are synoptic accounts of the life of Christ. Keep in mind, Christ lived under the old law. He lived under the law of Moses. Now, even though Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are in the New Testament, the events that went on there were under the old covenant. The new covenant didn't come into effect until Christ died on the cross. You see? Matter of fact, when you read the book of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews tells you all about that. You know, about the old law and how, you know, it was ordained by priests and how the blood of goats and animals, you know, were the acceptable sacrifices at the time. But when Christ died and, you know, died one time for all time, he was the mediator of the New Testament, the New Covenant. Okay. Right, right. He nailed the old cross, old law to the cross. In other words, it went out when he did. And it ushered in the new covenant. Okay? Uh, we're out of time. Next week, you all, you're going to start looking at the Bible study triangle.